hello. I think we're, um, we have three minutes, but if you are sitting in the back half of the room, if you feel comfortable, no pressure, I'd love for you to come to the front part of the room. One, because the room's not very full, and um, second, I do like to get people um, talking and the mics up here, and so um, it's, it'll be a lot easier for everybody to hear. So if you're in the back half and you feel comfortable to move forward, and um, there's really nice people here, I met someone named Amy who seemed very nice. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started because I, I think. Also, uh, they do not have anything scheduled for this room because I'm the last session of the day. Yay. And um, the good thing is this is really fun. So all of you who have been like cramming things into your head, like just relax. This is really fun. The slides will be up. And mostly you'll just get it. Like you'll go, oh, yeah. Why hadn't I thought of that before? So um, I also don't know everything. And actually, you guys know just as much. So if you would like, um, I'll go through all the slides. But we can actually stay and play a little bit after if you like. So hello. Uh, I now uh, started a new job with Pantheon, and so I am buying everyone here a free account at Pantheon. So if you go to getpantheon.com, you can have a free hosted website until you want to make it go live, and then we charge you money. <laughs> but actually, um, I actually I think as developers, if it's for your own personal site, uh, your website, I do believe it's free, and I just don't know how to do it yet because I just started Monday. So I'm sponsored by uh, Pantheon, and I'm also sponsored by Top Shelf Modules. So you can ask me about either one of those later. But right now, it's all about you. So um, I was so surprised that they actually um, picked this topic, um, because this has been a passion of mine for a very long time. And uh, I am so glad that you're here to share it with me. All right, who's here? How many are engineers? Yay, OK. Um, how many, and I call everybody who actually does the building, site building, designing thing, all of you are engineers. Um, how many people are here from a development company or an agency? OK. How many are from the client side, like you're with a university or an organization or a library? And you guys actually have the harder job. I want everybody to appreciate how hard their job is, because they can't fire their client. So that makes it really, really hard, right? Um, and so I think you will get a lot of takeaway because if you actually treat your internal stakeholders with some of this rigor, it will help you not go crazy. Um, how many of you are thinking about a project, you're like a customer and you're getting ready to go into a project? Nobody? Those are the people I like to talk to. <laughs> they should be here. Go find some. Um, how many are in a project that they wish they didn't have to finish? Yeah. Oh, yay. OK, so maybe we can do a little rescue and triage here, OK? So I talked to some of you, and I do know some of the things that you're trying to get to, and I hope you leave with some really good tools today. And they're all really dead simple. There's nothing fancy that I do. I've just been doing it forever. Um, so my name is Susan Rust. I've been in Drupal since 4.7, and I picked Drupal because it was actually the one at the time that had clean URLs. And if I can encourage you guys walking in to come forward and sit up front, that would be awesome. Um, I've done tiny, tiny jobs. I did a three-page website for a tiny, it's not even a church. They're called plant, plant sites or something like that. Um, and a, a woman named Betty ran the whole thing, all 12 people that attended this little tiny thing. And I felt sorry for them, and I built them a little Drupal site. And I've done really big enterprise projects with uh, the National Episcopal Church and SDG&E and Ion Media and things like that. And then from this morning's note, I found out that I'm a dictator. And I was so pleased to find out that I actually have a role in Drupal. And that's why, actually, I love being here with this community. So I, I ended up with a design shop, a graphic design shop. And I kept doing logos. And people kept saying, yeah, but where's my website? That looks awesome. And I'm like, you understand that print and web are not the same thing, right? And they're like, yeah, but whatever. So I learned to build websites. And then I learned to do Drupal. Thank goodness for the Google. Um, any questions so far? Is everybody in the right place? They want to learn how to do ugly baby meetings? 
So we have to know why projects fail, because actually to have a cure or a remedy or a solution for everything, you have to know why it happened in the first place. There has to be a little bit of diagnosis. So why do projects fail? Somebody tell me. Why do projects fail? Yeah. Yeah, managing expectations, like everybody's expectations, right? So that's very important. Why else do projects fail? Who has a, yes, guy with the hat. More planning, More planning yeah. You mean not enough planning. Yes. Oh yeah, a roadmap for, to go somewhere. money or what happens on projects where there's nobody on the client side working on it. It's like build us a site, we have 27,000 pages of content and uh, yeah, just figure it out for us. Like that works well, right? So one of the things, <laughs> one of the things I would like you guys to start understanding and seeing for yourself is avalanches happen how? One snowflake at a time. But if you've ever been on ski patrol or been up in the mountains, they know where the avalanches are going to happen, right? And actually now in hindsight, when you look at your bad projects, don't you kind of know that that was an avalanche just waiting to happen? How many of you were ever truly, truly surprised that the avalanche happened? Yeah, no one, right? So one of the things is you have to listen to yourself. So I don't read all the slides, but this one's really important. Failed projects are doomed from the beginning. No one wants to admit it. And that's the genesis. And so one of the things about not having ugly client baby meetings is to not turn them into projects, or not turn them into projects yet. Any questions? OK. So. On the client side, so one of the things that clients often think is that the website will cure all of their business woes. They don't have process in place, they haven't analyzed their business, they don't even know what they're trying to do, but if they would just get a new website and marketing could go to town, everything would be okay. And the truth is, is that a website only presents data and it only is a reflection of their internal clarity. So if they don't have internal clarity, what's the website project going to be? It's going to be a mess. And so this is one of those avalanche moments where you can say, ah, first thing, they have no business rules written down anywhere. Now, how many of you have seen business rules that go something like this? Well, we send out an email and then we attach a Word doc. Then, fill in the blank, fill in the blank, fill in the blank. Is that a business process? No, it's not a business process. I'm working with a client right now that sends secure data back and forth via email and random other channels, and they're so worried about if the Drupal site's going to be secure. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, you just sent all that data over the email to 75 people. So um, they don't have a business process around their communication of important data. So how do we model that properly for Drupal? And you have to solve that question before you can begin the project. So one of the things that I say about clients and projects is that day one is the best it's ever going to be. It's kind of like a boyfriend or a marriage, right? Like the honeymoon phase is as good as it's gonna get. After that, there's dirty dishes and dirty socks. So if you're not really loving the vendor, if you're really not loving the client, if it's just not, you know, you don't have that chemistry, like you don't feel like you're on the same side, is the project actually gonna be fun to work on? And how many of you have a client or a project now that it's not thing wrong with the project, it's the chemistry with the client? Yeah, it makes work going, going to work really hard. And when, it, when you want to go to work and it's really hard, it takes all the joy out of you. And when it takes all the joy out of you, it's really hard to succeed. 
And what happens when you tie up all your time, because some of you that I spoke to around the room are pretty small. So what happens if you take up 80% of your billable time with a client and a project you don't love? It's just tough. And one of the things about doing well as a solopreneur, an entrepreneur, small group, is that you have to all love what you're doing. And there's an opportunity cost to every decision you make. So I actually saw uh, something very similar to this um, in Dallas-Fort Worth. They built a, Dallas-Fort Worth airport is as big as the island of Manhattan. And they built this monorail that went around. And I would drive by it every day to and from work. And at one point I went, that's not going to meet. And my husband went, ah, you don't know what you're talking about. And sure enough, but they kept building. Like, like I was seeing it at an angle from the road and I could tell it wasn't going to meet. The engineers were standing there looking at each other every day and they knew it wasn't going to meet, but they kept building and they built within like 20 feet of each other. Like, but you could tell a long way off, right? Like maybe a half mile down. Like, yeah, guys, we need an S-curve in here, but they never did it. They never did it. So lack of planning and then the desire not to stop and do some planning. So how many of you guys think that it's a good idea for me to take a backpack and decide that I'm going to climb Everest? It's really not. <laughs> oh, you think it's a good idea? Oh, he's trying to get rid of me already. Um, so this is what happens, though. They're all, all engineers in general love to write code. And there's an urge and a, and a deep desire to get a project and start building. But this is how those end up. It's not a good idea. I can't walk very far. I get high altitude sickness. And in general, I'm not that athletic. So I probably shouldn't plan a trek to, to Everest in an afternoon. And then we also have what I call the project fantasy, is that at the beginning of every project, we think it's going to feel and look like this. But we know it's going to be like this. But in order to be in business, like we have to keep kind of having that fantasy. So today, I hope we cover some things to get the projects looking more like this and less like that. So any, any questions so far? OK. So one of the things that I started out very early on is realizing that one of my gifts I need to step back. One of my gifts is that I I'm not an engineer, but I can speak pigeon engineer. And I don't really, I'm not a formal business analyst, but I'm very good at divining that gap between the client wanting something and what engineering wants to build. And that is, uh, how many of you are kind of like under five people in your company? This is the biggest strength that you can have. And if you have a small company you probably and are successful, you probably are already doing this in some pretty concrete uh, or maybe ununderstood way. And if you can keep developing that skill and developing the strength and muscle to do it better and better, your projects will become way more professional, or and not professional, profitable. So what I found is that clients do this. I want to do this. And because this is how I do it in my business. And the engineer goes, yep, I can build that. And they go, OK. And the engineer goes off and builds that. And it's really expensive because it's custom. Or the clients just start talking about all their business process and their clients and their metrics. And the engineers just go, I don't care. Tell me what to code. I will build you anything. Just stop talking about that. And, and so there's just this big gap. And then the client goes, well, what can I have? And the engineer says, anything. I'm an engineer. And like, well, what does that look like? Well, whatever you want it to look like. I'm an engineer. So there's this impasse between what it is, what can be built, and what's possible, and what's inexpensive, and what's a good choice, and all that kind of stuff. So um, this became the first part of my consulting life, is kind of doing this translation. What do I mean by uh, if a client isn't coachable is one of the reasons projects fail. 
who's got a who's got an example of an uncoachable client? Well, yes. Generally, when um, client states their expectations, and as a developer, you have the ability to perhaps shift their expectations a little bit to allow you to develop something that perhaps more than time, as opposed to spending all this time doing custom work. Yeah, yeah, that's a good example. What about clients that say, "I know exactly what I want." <laughs> yeah, or yes. Yes, they're, they're trying to guide you um, through engineering speak um, because they know better. Uh, so to me, coachable clients are people that don't listen to me. I don't care what it is. It's about where to park, uh, whatever. As a dictator, um, you have to actually be coachable. And that doesn't mean that you just accept everything that I say, but it means that when I'm really serious about saying, I think this is the best path for you and this is why, that you consider it carefully. It doesn't mean that that is the answer, but that you think about it deeply and you say, yes, I see why you think that, and here are things you don't know about my business. That's a coachable client. They're teaching me, I'm teaching them. It's a relationship. People that don't want to be guided um, aren't going to make you happy, and, if, and the project won't go well. What do I mean by this, wrong shop to client mix? How many of you taken a project that's either too small, too big, or slightly out of your wheelhouse? How many, no, keep your hands up. How many of those projects went really, really well? Yeah. So it's a, it's a, da it's a, it's a odd mix, because if you never take anything out of your wheelhouse, it's boring, right? And if you don't grow and you don't learn the next thing, and it's also really smart when you're, when you're a growing shop to really be advised not to tackle the things that you can fail at spectacularly. Little failures are good, right? Fail often, fail quickly, but fail where it doesn't count. Like it won't drive you out of business, you won't have to let people go, your reputation will be damaged, and your reputation at the size that you are is everything. So be sure that when you say yes to projects, they're the right project for your company in the right part of your growth cycle. And um, it's always good to take on something a little challenging, but be sure that you can get resources and support to help you grow. Who took on a, something really big um, and was successful at it? Let's hear that story, because that's more interesting. Um, I saw a little tiny hand right there, yes. Mm -hmm. that we had never done before. And how did you do it successfully? They really worked with us to under, so that we understood how they wanted to classify the data and how they wanted their users to be able to come in and access it because the users were actually the data creators. Nice. So she didn't do exactly what I was going to recommend, but her client was exactly what I was going to recommend was tackle big things with alliances. And in that instance, they, they, because they, it was the data and they were the data creators, that was an alliance. And that's a really good way to grow. And be very honest about it and say, and decide up front what the risks are for you and for them, and be open about that on uh, risk. And then also say, let's have a triage point where we can pull the plug where we won't be the right vendor. Right? Like, wouldn't that make it a lot easier? Like, if you just had that honesty of communication and they were clear, and then if it doesn't work out, are they mad at you? No, because we already decided up front that we may or may not be able to do it and usually end up like giving them free research time and things like that because you want to grow to that. So, that's a really good way to have done it, and that was a wise way to tackle that project. So, um, now, is anybody in here strongly invested in the front-end design of things? Okay, I hope I don't make you mad. So I started out as a designer, a graphic artist, so I, I speak of with this from having come from that place and what I have found to 
make money and do the least amount of work. Like that is the other thing that we want to do, right? So I uh, also used to do interior design because I have a BFA and uh, I, the analogy that I use is that I can't order your wallpaper and your drapes until we've built the house. Because at the end of the day, I don't really know exactly where everything's going to end up. And if I do it, I can do it before the project. I can do it before, but you're going to pay more money because I'm going to order way more wallpaper than I need and the drapes aren't really going to fit and we're going to have to tailor them. So the first thing is you have to do the analysis. What should the site do? Then you engineer how that's going to work in Drupal and then you overlay your beautiful design onto that which already works. Um, how many of you get really beautiful comps from somewhere? How many of those projects are really fun to build? Yeah, not so much because every single button you have to, re you're reverse engineering the end. So it's kind of like me ordering 175 yards of fabric and laying it down there and go, build me the windows that fit the draperies. Right? And I, I <laughs> it, it doesn't work. And so, what I do, and I was going to build a slide for this, and I'm sorry I ran out of time, but there's actually a process where you do all of your business analysis, and then you go into engineering, and you can start your design, because you, in the front part of the process, you've built your wireframes, and then at the very end, the last two weeks of a project is theming. How many of you theme kind of continuously through the project? Save yourself so much time and money, don't do it. Um, don't do it. Just wait until the end. Leave everything as ugly and gray as possible. Um, build yourself this very generic version of, of your site. Do it in Bartik, whatever, Garland, it doesn't matter. Get your client to quit looking at design when you're trying to talk engineering. What do I mean by this? Focus on trees, not the forest. How many of you have clients that keep moving pixels on you? <laughs> That's what happens when you start design too early. Um, it drives you crazy and it takes a lot of time and a lot of money and nothing really ever gets built because you're just moving pixels and changing hex colors. So, um, but it can be about anything. It can be about billing. It can be about wanting to see hours. It's about wanting to have a client meeting every day. It's any time that what they're requesting doesn't move the ball forward. Who's got a good example of a behavior like this? Yes. Yeah, so she had comps and they kept adjusting the comps, trying to guess what people were going to, how they were going to use something that had not yet been built. And that's a really good example of that. And that's a really good example of why you take away design until you're done with engineering. So how many of you have clients that like want itemized bills and why did this planning take, why did you have to do 25 minutes of research on this module? How many of you have that? How do you cure that? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> who who has a cure for that? Yes. I think one of the things that we do at the media is kind of over communicate. Uh-huh. What we do uh, proactively as opposed to reactively. Yeah. Um we kind of create that um sense of we're the experts. Yeah, that is actually a good good methodology is to stay in clear communications. A lot of times as a small company, that is a big challenge. Who else has a good solution for that? Yes. I am, um, uh, from various, trying various things, I've decided that transparency is the best thing. So just to be really upfront and say, you know, and if they are trying to nickel and dime, uh, you know, it's to say, why are you trying to do this? You know, let's talk about it. You know, and also to be very clear about how you are using your hours and, and tracking things. But I think it is about communication and transparency. You know, where, I, mean, I work with mainly, mainly internal clients, so maybe it's a little easier for me to do that. Yeah. So she's saying that, kind of just basically saying, why are you nitpicking me? <laughs> like, let, let's ha and have that conversation up front. Wonderful.
What do I mean by process driven than rather driven? And it's a little bit about what we talked about, so I'm going to move on. So one of the things that I've discovered in working on a lot of projects is that if you think you're, you've estimated your project at 200 hours, how much time does a client have to put in? 200 hours. And they don't really know this, so it's up to you to educate them that, hey, you know, we're going into a 1,000-hour project, we're going into a 1,500-hour project. It does often take that much time, because the larger the site, the more people, the more stakeholders, the more meetings, and they need to be prepared to do that work. That's a big risk point. And these are just things we hate to hear, right? Like, nobody likes this, uh, any of these things. And, and I'm glad you guys are laughing because I hope you understand that these are universally true. Like, there, it's happened to all of us and happened to... Who has, who has never had anything on this list happen to them? <laughs> <laughs> See, you, I'm not really that smart. So let's talk about now that we've kind of identified, like, what the problem is, like, how to avoid them. So a project requires a visionary. It can be you. In you should also have someone on the other side of the fence who is also a visionary. Without the two of you, and whoever the visionary is, it can be the owner, it can be the, uh, I have an extraordinary uh, project manager that I get to work with every now and then, um, but they have a very strong vision of how this is going to get done and when. Maybe not from an engineering standpoint, but they're very clear on how they're going to work with the clients and all that stuff. So identify who that visionary is, and I, I find it interesting that often the person in charge of the project is the engineer who's trying to be heads down in code. And so the person that is heads down cannot, by default, be the visionary. And business owners, unfortunately, often are left brain, right brain, and can do both. Um, but at some point, it's not good necessarily the most effective way. So uh, when I was doing consulting, I actually trademarked the term client wrangling, and I actually got hired to do client wrangling. So it was pretty fun. Um, what do I mean by force projects into an MVP state? Who knows what MVP is? OK, so MVP is the minimum viable product. So it's the smallest unit of thing that you can create features to say it's a website. So usually projects come in, and there's like 20 pages of things, and you meet with the client, and it's hours and hours of stuff. And your job is to force. Notice I don't say suggest. I say force a project into an MVP state. So those are the reasons for it. But who can tell me why this makes sense? Not, those are like great reasons. But why is it really important for you to do this very early on? Who's raising their hand? Yes, it's actually, that's actually true. But the other part of it is not only fail, but succeed. The smaller you make it, the less complicated the task, the more likely you are to succeed. And what happens the minute you succeed? You have instant trust. Then you can keep growing and stretching and getting into more and more complicated things. So if you force that first unit into, and you know, when you're a small business owner and someone's like, I have a $50,000 site, I have a $100,000 site, I have a $300,000, whatever your metric is for a juicy project, cut it in half. Cut it in a f to 25%. Cut it into the smallest unit you can, because if you knock that out of the park, all those other bad client behaviors, a lot of them will disappear because they trust you. You've had a win together. And that's the most important thing you can do. So um, who has a good example of that? Oh, anybody here doing that? A few of you. OK. Go ahead. Someone said something. It doesn't always work. It doesn't always work. Tell me why. Mm -hmm. that we're that are built, and can wait can, one moment? Can everybody hear her? <coughs> now, can you come to the mic? Yeah, sure. So we do a lot of projects where we take over Drupal sites and fix them, and then 
you know, then the client wants us to then add new functionality to it. Right. So the fix part is actually the easy part. Right. You know, if somebody's built something wrong or it's not secure or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we'd say, let's just bite that off as a small piece and we can show them how we can make their site work better and and they're all, oh wow, this is working great. And then we move on to new functionality and we break it down into chunks and it's still hard to put new functionality into a site you haven't built because mm -hmm. other developers don't do things the way you do. And they're like, well, we really, we know that you've done all this other stuff for us, but we want this faster and quicker. And it didn't, it didn't build the trust at all. Is that a coachable client? No. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> So that's, you, a, that's a good, it's a good process, but then if it doesn't work, you're back to square one with throwing the client away. But, but it comes from actually deciding at the front end whether the client was coachable. And, that, and then that is really important. So you see how, like, if you don't have that coachable client all along the process, you can't really ever grow them into a good partnership. So, and the other thing is picking the right team um, internally and externally. And uh, this is often what I see. And when I say team, I mean like the client's team. I actually talked to someone who was doing this mega enterprise site, and the project manager l literally was a recently former massage therapist. But she was the most technical person because she knew how to do social media, so they made her in charge of this project. So what would I tell you, now that you know me, what would I tell you to tell the client when their team is awful? Buy. Yeah, no, not necessarily buy, but you have to say, your team is awful. Yeah. So, it's, it, you, can, you have to say it more diplomatically, and you can say, you know, I, for this kind of project, these are the areas of expertise that I need covered with your team, or perhaps these are people that need to be more team-oriented. Uh, these are people that actually have to have time to do this project, and, you know, we talked about time earlier. So what if they disagree with your assessment? Oh, is that a coachable client? <laughs> <laughs> yes. The contact, uh huh. And our point of contact, and we tell them this is what will happen if you have more than one person in charge. Yeah. We are almost done with a project right now that decided they were going to be fine with having three people <laughs> as my counterpart. So right. I have to treat them. It's actually really fun for me because I just, every time they take someone off a of CC, I put them right back on. And every time somebody else emails me, I bring everybody else on. And yeah. Yeah, so your client wrangling is what you are. Oh, I'm yeah, <laughs> you're hurting. <laughs> so, um, and this last part is important too. Like, different people need to be on the team at different times. You don't need everybody doing the whole project the whole time necessarily. So, kind of, kind of manage that. Like, we don't, we don't think often as companies that we're the ones in charge of organizing that. But yeah, you, you kind of are. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, well, you got to see that person day after day. Yeah. Or the person on that other team. And they're, they're often not coachable because they know they don't have to be. Yeah, that's why I said you guys have the hardest job. Um, and a lot of it can be helped by process where it's a little passive aggressive where you say, <laughs> and that's the only thing that you can do is say, oh, well, I see that you want these things done, but here's our process. And as soon as you get your part done, we'll do our part. So that, that helps, but you actually have to have a fairly formal structured process that has the sanction and permission to hold in, uh, as an in, a piece of in business unit with integrity. So uh, we talked about triage things and all that kind of stuff, but teamwork is important. Uh, one of the things, I was with a, a team and they were, they had uh, a very, very big site to do, and they had 90,000. And I'm like, wow, that's kind of skimpy. He goes, yeah, we burned through the other million. <laughs> other 900,000, it was a million dollar budget. I said, what happened to the other 900,000? They spent a year going down um, the road with Vignette. 
But that's, that's not the tragic part. This wasn't a fault of vignette. So I don't want anyone to say, I don't want any legal letters. This is not the fault of vignette. This was the fault of the client whose engineering team sat in the sales meeting, knew dead on that it would not handle users the way the project spoke, uh, you know, the project specs were, and they had no authority, even as the technical team, to throw a flag on the play and say this will fail. So everybody in your company, everybody on the client side, you have to have this important meeting that says everybody has a permission to throw a flag on the play and stop development so we can talk about it. And that is just a clear boundary that will help so much because often on a very difficult client, somebody on the other side is knowing some drama that's going on that's going to derail it. They know very early on. They just don't think it's their job to say so. And so you have to empower people to help you get these kinds of things done. Um, anybody have a good juicy story about that? Besides my good juicy story? That was a pretty sad one, right? $900,000 down Nothing the thing. Specific, yeah. yeah. It's more of, I know a number of people I saw hands up for people who worked in a university environment. Mm -hmm. I used to, as an engineer in that environment, you are powerless. And if you try and throw the red flag down, you get the, you're not being a team player card thrown back at you. Mm -hmm. It's really rough. It is difficult. It's a, it's a big cultural change when you're inside of an institution. You could be inside of a big .org or .edu or, or association, and it, it's tough. It's, and it, it's, it is a very deep cultural change, and that's why it's like it actually takes leadership and vision, and people on the team who are more heads down doing the work, they, they need that leadership and vision. And a lot of times, if you just write this document down and say, just to let you know, as the a consulting firm as a development firm. These are our norms that we're bringing to this project, and we will respect anybody on the team that does this. So maybe inside the in, or um, inside of the whole institution, but maybe you can create enough of a safe haven, just enough breathing room for that to happen. Uh, let's see. Um, so most of you know this kind of thing, that there's three things. If, if you want something faster, you have to give us more money and less features and blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of a thing like that. But what's also important is that there needs to be three different people. If you are the person wearing all these three decision points, it doesn't really work. The system works best in tension. So look at your own development team, your project management, your ownership styles, um, all the different stakeholders, and assign these roles. Let someone be an advocate for features. Let someone be an advocate for budget. Let someone be an advocate for time. In general, it's something like that up there. I don't think I have a laser pointer on this, but those top three stakeholders. Normally, it's something like that, but it's very important to keep that tension alive. That's what keeps the project taut and moving forward. So you guys get this, right? And these are, these are really important things to do here. And so now I'm going to give you an actual solution tool. So um, doing a big project, I think it's close to a half million dollars. And uh, even in the very beginning, though, one of the things that I do is I actually start with this matrix with, with the client. So remember how we were saying MVP, minimum viable product? The first thing I always try to do is to never have custom development in phase one. As little custom Drupal as possible. Try to do Drupal out of the box. You guys forget how magical Drupal is to people that don't know what it does. Like, you forget. And now it's not so uh, rare, but there was a time when if you could just have login, that was something you used to pay 20 grand for. Like, there, Drupal does amazing things. Views is magical. Like, if you ever sit down and explain to someone who doesn't understand content management system, the whole concept of views and blocks, their mind is blown. Like, Drupal does amazing things if you do nothing with it but just build a site and manage content and have users. So we try to start with everything um, that is critical and as much out of the box as possible. I really try to stay in quadrant one. That's a one one. And I do this with the client. So we would like blah, blah, blah to integrate with blah, blah, blah and then show up magically on this page. It's like, great. Is it critical? Well, it's a, yeah, well, 
maybe, so it's needed. Well, marketing would really like it. Like, if you really drill down into what's critical for a launch, that list is really surprisingly small sometimes. So keep pushing, and then I tell them they don't get the stuff in the yellow. That's off the table for the first conversation. And that really helps them. And you know what? They really like this. Because this is something they can wrap their heads around. Because they don't know, in general, what Drupal does out of the box. Like, it's pretty cool. And even language in the contract says, unless otherwise stated, you're getting Drupal out of the box. You had some expectation? Well, if Drupal out of the box doesn't do that, it's not covered. So what did I just give you the secret to? Yeah, that's one of the big expectations. I thought Drupal did that. Well, yes, it does. Then why don't I have it? Because you didn't pay $75,000 for it. Well, I think I should get that. Because <laughs> I thought it was important, right? How many of you had that conversation? Like, why doesn't Facebook work differently on my website than it does everywhere else, right? So how many of you would find this useful? Anybody doing something similar? OK, awesome. So, um, but you can use this kind of matrix for everything. So, let's see, is this the second one? Okay. So, midway in this very, very big project, um, it's been going on for 14 months, very big team of, of engineers working on it, and a month before launch, a month before launch, end of a huge uh, sprint cycle of like six sprints, the client came back, oh, they finally did some testing. <laughs> And the list came in, it was like a rainstorm of new features and changes. And, and it was horrifying, right? Like you get four typewritten pages of things that they think should be different or work differently. And so the product owner, he's like, yeah, I want all these changes. And the project manager who's in charge of time is going, nothing's getting done. I've got my sprint planned. And the engineers are like, meh, I'll throw something else out and build that. I don't care, right? <laughs> So we have two of the three people kind of like at, at odds. And I'm like, OK, great, let's make a matrix. And they're like rolling their eyes. But this is what we did. We said, look, things are either done, or they've kind of been engineered, or they're built. Right? That's kind of the state of how you can find something in, in the actual project. And it's either an independent thing, uh, meaning that it's a, it's a request that doesn't touch anything else. right? Or maybe it's a little related. It might touch some other things, so there's some possibility of breaking. Or, uh-oh, this will mess with the entire structure of organic groups and all the dashboards. So we just did this matrix. And if it was built, and it was integral to everything else that was built, they didn't get it. And what was really great was that it made everybody sit down and put everything in a matrix, which took like 15 minutes. Like, Can you imagine how long people would have spent arguing over this otherwise. So they took the four pages, and we put them in here, and went, meh, that's pretty good. And so we came up with like a one and a half page list, and then we did this. Because we're still trying to meet that deadline, right? Just because they crammed in a bunch of stuff, they're not going to let us launch later. And we did that. Like, it's less than 20 hours, it's more than 20 hours, or it's a black hole. Like, we got to do research, it's probably going to change the scope. And we came back to them with what came out in the green and said, this is what can get done without costing you extra money or time. And they went, OK. But see, we actually had a reason and a rationale. And when we showed them, we actually showed them the matrix list. And they went, OK, that's really reasonable. And they were happy. Like, but the whole four pages when it came in had that client must be done for launch, right? But you can kind of help them sort through that. So this is tremendously valuable. And you can do this like, I want to go on a vacation. I'm, we need people to work. Like You can make your matrix all day long. And it just is very helpful. It's very fast. So planning, we talked about that earlier. OK, how am I doing on time? Oh, I've got four minutes. OK, so I want to tell you some other really good things. So when I first got to one of my clients that we grew their shop from 3 to 15 people, this is what they did. This is what a dev shop does. And this is what they do now. So all of you need to add more of this stuff in right now. And so I'm going to just talk to you about these four things so that you can see them. 
And um, I think I have to, oh, don't laugh at Homer. Are you guys having fun? Are you guys learning stuff? Yes. Oh, very weak. Say yes. I'm being recorded. OK. <laughs> OK, so the first thing is, um, uh, how many of you use Omni Outliner? Favorite tool of mine. Everybody write that down. That's an incredible uh, tool. So we actually do audits. So we actually spend time figuring out all the URLs that we're going to build and what it is and, and like that. Um, there's notes in here like which are third-party integrations, needs more discovery, um, things that are problems. And there's another corollary document um, that actually goes with it that is also done in Omni Outliner that actually starts to capture what it is, content type, view, block, et cetera. And that actually uh, you can add right in here because you can do columns with that. Um, the other thing, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on storyboards, um, but there's a thing called snippets. So when I first got to this company, uh, I looked at their tickets, and the ticket said build a view. And for more information, see specs. Is that a ticket? How many of you have tickets that look like that? OK, when you're one guy and it's in your head, you met with the client, you know them, you can do that. The minute there's two, it can't work anymore. And it starts to disintegrate. It's that avalanche moment that I'm telling you about. But even if you're one person, you should do this. So now, can you guys see that? No. Um, I don't know how to make it bigger. This is a very cumbersome tool for that. Let me see if I can just do this. OK, is that better? OK, so now when they put in a ticket that says build a view, this is what it starts doing. <coughs> because if you build a view three times, you haven't made any money on it. And just a simple thing like knowing what the URL is going to be in advance, what are the fields? There's actually more of this where it says every field has to be whether the label is hidden, displayed, what are the image cache profiles, are you using the image fields from some other view? all that kind of stuff. And what happens if you do this for your entire site up front? You start to see that you only need four image presets, not 22. You see that you only need to use this field as a reference rather than building it uniquely on each view. Um, this helps speed up everything, it makes your site way more scalable. How many of you build out dashboards? OK, so that's the best thing that you can do in Drupal. And this is something that we do early in discovery, is that we don't bother with what the wireframes are so much. We build them their dashboard wireframes. Because what surfaces when you build the wireframe dashboard for the end user? Someone tell me. I'm not going to pick on you just because I haven't picked on enough people. But I'm so glad you have anything. Who, who knows why you would want to build a wire dashboard? Somebody raise their hand. Yes. It's what they care about most, but what is, what's often they're like, well, how do I manage this? And that this turns into a whole thing, right? So if you build the dashboard and lay that out, that tells you every content type you need. It tells you every feature you need. It tells you every view that you need. It tells you what they're expecting the site to do. Because if they want to manage it from here, and you cannot believe the gaps that come up, once we do that, they're like, hey, how can I do this? And it's like, that was never anywhere in any of the documents. And that's so valuable. OK, we're actually at time. And if you want to go, you can. Um, there's nothing until the final keynote. So if you want to stay, um, I just have a few more things. And then this is, um, and you can actually leave after this if you choose. I have 15 minutes. Oh, I have 15 minutes? Oh, yay. Oh, good. I thought the time went really fast. OK, so, OK, good. Because this is really important. So this is something that I started doing very recently called storyboards. And storyboards are incredible. And if you have any facility of, of storytelling, this is what it is. So how many of you do any kind of user stories? So user stories are great, except for it doesn't translate into anything Drupal. It's just a paragraph. And at the end of the day, the gap is, is that you can take all the user stories you want, but engineering could care less. They really don't respond to user stories. So what we started doing is this thing called storyboarding. And what it is, it's a workflow of the user story in Drupal. 
So it's the user story told in Drupal. And so we have legends and we reuse the same things over and over again. So this is the different roles. And let me tell you, I, we, I scoped a project. They said, oh, we only have three users. We only need uh, three people. That's all that'll ever log in and administrate the site. And 17 roles later, we're like at the organic group. So this is really important. And then um, how many of you work with very non-technical customers? This is the best tool for you. So this is also done in Omni Graffle. And so uh, w you can do this yourself. And so I tell a little story of, oh, darn it, I'm not supposed to have that up there. Don't no read that. So uh, the <laughs> an employee visits the site, and then all this stuff happens, and then a video is uploaded, and then it's visited by employees, OK? And then these are the different things that happen. Here's where some taxonomy happens. Here's where a content type is created. It has this taxonomy. Um, the person logs in. It does these things. It gets notifications. The administrator does this. And then somebody logs in, and they can do these different things. And then a project ends, and this is what they're able to do. Now, I'll show you another one real quick. So more things, see a lot of people, they swore only three. Here are our content types um, that they said was just two. And then this is a workflow around all this stuff that's all super secret. And then they email it around and then, um, but you can see like all of a sudden how you can start to take apart their Word document they sent you, and you can actually start turning it into Drupal. And what's useful for this is um, that what I can do from here is really cool. So in, um, let me go back to my keynote, because I have a great slide for this. So, um, so this. First of all, it's very, very fast. And so it doesn't cost anything to do, because you're doing that darn user story read through anyway. But it's, so it's very inexpensive and lightweight, which is a big savings to you. And, but the most important thing, no matter how lowly technical your client, they understand what's going on, because it's their workflow that you're illustrating. Um, but what was really weird to me, because you know I'm more on the, the business development sales side, is that my engineers loved this. They were thrilled with it. And you know why? Because I can take this document, eight-page document, put it in front of my engineer. And you know, we now know what all the different symbols mean. And he reads through it just like he would code. And in two, three, four minutes, he marks it up and goes, problem, problem, this doesn't work like this. Yep, yep, find out more about this. And so we get like this first pass at architecture that costs 10 minutes of his time. And that's really, really important. And um, how many of you tried to write back, write up this stuff to send back to the client? Like you do the, yeah, like a scope of work. This is my scope of work, even for very large projects. It's a preliminary one. And guess what? They actually read through it. How many of you have had that scope of work? Everybody signs it. There's a deposit. And midway through the project, they're like, where's this magical feature that I was expecting? And it's like, well, it's not in the scope of work. Well, you overlooked that. You should build it for me for free. Yeah. <laughs> so this really solves that. It also does something else really magical. It avoids scope creep. And you know why? It's because they actually understood what you were selling them. They understood it as an actual development cycle for what they were trying to get done. So anything on that? Anybody have any insights? Or can, can anybody see how they, they are going to find some value in that? That's like the, the matrix and those two things are probably the best thing you can do for yourself. It accelerates architecture for free. That's a big deal. Yes? Is there a <sighs> Yeah, OmniGraffle has a bunch of templates, and then um, they have a lot of frameworks. And you can buy, like people make OmniGraffle um, templates that you can insert in. And then over time, I've just made my own. But yeah, it's really fun. It takes minutes. And you know, sometimes it's nice to do something mindlessly creative. OK, so lots of tools. 
Um, okay, how many of you have love talking about money on a project? <laughs> yeah. So again, this is an area of coachability, and so uh, I cannot tell you the number of times people don't actually have good budgets for their projects. It's horribly underfunded, it's undermanned, and it's mission critical to their company. And it makes no sense. And so that's a really big warning flag for me. Um, I'm working with a university right now, college actually, and um, they've allocated no people, no resources, and what is the value of a student? How many, know, how many of you are, have some sense that a student, they, they bring in 200 to $250,000? It's a big sale. A student is worth a quarter million dollars and, and they're like grumbling because you're saying phase one might be $120,000. So it's really worth half a student, but we want to enroll 20,000 students over the next three years, but, but we don't want to spend more than this. So there's a funny relationship to how much they're willing to invest. And it's a, it's a very good way to start off the conversation is the value proposition of the site. What is it that you want it to do? And how is it that you want it to convert? And don't talk about it in terms of your hours and time. Your hours and time are not interesting to them. It's what they're trying to get done on the site. I had someone um, uh, say, you know what? And I cannot tell you what a big company they were. They're like, we don't pay for QA, and we don't pay for PM. We pay for engineering. And I said, great. I completely get that. And they now pay engineering rates for QA and PM. So it works out great. <laughs> you cannot not pay for QA and PM, because otherwise your engineer's doing it. And engineers are expensive, and they're scarce. So don't do that. Like, that is just goofy. And if the client tells you that, just tell them what I did. That's so great. We're completely on board with that. <laughs> and they're like, why does it take so long to build everything? It's like, because I have to QA and PM it. <laughs> um, matrix magic. So how many of you are really good at estimating? So this is the way engineers estimate. If I stay in my dorm room all night long, and I drink Red Bull, and I don't text my friends, I don't play World, World, Warcraft, World of Warcraft, um, I can do this in a day, a day meaning 24 hours. Uh, a day to management means 6.5 billable hours. So already we're like way disconnected, right? And, and everything is never going to have a problem. Their environment's always going to work. The deployment's always going to go well. Um, but even outside of that, there's some things that you can look at as estimating. How many of you are here responsible for estimating, if not money, at least time? OK, great. So I borrowed um, this very lightly from Node 1. And are you able to see this down here? So there's some things that uh, create variables when you're going to build something. One of them is risk. So if it's really important to the project, you need to give yourself a little bit more buffer. If on that magic matrix they said, this is critical, this must talk to the Biblio module, then you probably want to bump up your hours around it because you can't like be just OK that it kind of mostly works. Um, the other thing is complexity. Uh, if you've done views and it's just more views, great. It's a one, right? But if it's something that you haven't quite built, it's solar with a module that's still in beta, um, it's not that it's hard, but it's not uh, something that you're completely familiar with, that, uh, that complexity might be a two. Um, and then how many times you've done it? It's complex, it's Salesforce integration, but I do those all day long. This one's a little different. Um, and then a coachable client. So you can see how two hours can really vary from six to 18. And, I, and this is just on dev hours. This doesn't count um, project management, QA, and all those other overhead things. So you can see how a small business can really start to run into trouble right away if only engineering the engineering mind, if it's you doing everything, uh, does estimating. And then QA is sometimes 25%, um, depending on how complex it is. Uh, PM, it often takes 25%. And then we're lucky if we can get 10 or 15. Um, and then uh, design and theming. So there's lots of things in there where a two-hour project might really take you three days, might take you 30 hours.
And so if you look at um, different client A and client B, you can have the same complexity and the same experience, but a little bit more difficult client. Oh, I'm sorry, these should have been 1.5. Um, you can see like actually shifts your hours. If you have to spend more time actually talking to the client about everything, you need to account for that in the development time um, because a lot of conversation often means a lot of revision. So um, how many of you have uh, triage points on a project? How many of you know what I mean by that? Okay, so a triage point is like, have you guys seen MASH or like emergency ER? <laughs> er? Um, there's triage. If you go to the, how many of you have been to the emergency room? Like when you come in, they do actually kind of look at you. And sometimes it's better than others, but they decide if you're going to die or not. So if you have a respiratory thing, they'll take you in right away. If you have arterial bleeding, they'll take you in right away. Um, and then so you get through the first point of triage. And triage means every project should have a point where you can pull the plug. You should discuss these with the client, and you should know like at what point something's going to go wrong. A triage point can be they haven't paid their bill in two weeks. That's a triage point. Um, what's another triage point? What are some points where you should stop and look up? Yeah, the client's not responding, right? They haven't done UAT. They're not getting back with you on content and decisions. Client says they want something. You give it to them. The client says they want something else. Yes. Yeah, so they're, they're iterating before you even finish building. Like, they're just kind of spinning. That's a really good triage point. How would you triage that? Yeah, so that's, that's very, so that's a good uh, specific for what happened in that one point. But there's a bigger conversation that you can have and say, oh, well, let's sit down and talk about how development cycles go. And then you have the opportunity to, how many of you work in uh, sprints, even though if they're not very formal? Okay. So you need to explain to them what a sprint is and what happens all along the way. So. One of the things about managing client expectations is letting them know how it's going to go. We're going to go on a first date. I'm going to hold your hand. I'm going to take you and drop you. I'll walk you all the way up to the front door, and then I'll drive off. On the second date, we're going to go, and we're going to go to this restaurant, and then the ball game, and then I'm going to give you a kiss on the cheek. So, um, so that's kind of how you're going to explain sprints. It's like you're actually going to lay out, and you're going to preempt that behavior and say, this is something that often happens in a project. We build something and you want something different. And so here's how that's going to go. And then you tell them how that's going to go in advance. And then when it happens, you can go, oh, remember that thing that I said earlier on that's in my contract? And so let's decide what this is. Is this a new feature request? Is this, you know? So if you preempt things, like that, that always happen to you. And some of you have things that happen to you over and over again, and some of you never have those because you've learned to autocorrect. You can figure that out. But if anything's happening to you on every project, you need a preemptive conversation. Oh, I did want to talk about this phase one, phase two. One of the things that I notice is people get really attached to me working on projects with them. They like the fact that I'm a dictator, but that I'm pretty thoughtful and methodical and help things go better. And they really get some anxiety at the end of a project. And they think that they have to shove everything in at the last minute because I'll go away and they'll never see me again. <laughs> and sometimes it's a money thing, right? Or sometimes it's... Um, they don't understand that they've, they've bought a child that's growing up with them and they're never going to stop feeding and taking care of it. So one of the things that I always do is every time something like that happens is I tell them, oh, well, we're going to do that in phase two. We'll do that in phase three. So you're helping them understand this is a very long-term relationship with you. They've just started one tiny part of the path. Okay, do not buy the cheapest guides. You do not want to go up the mountain path with the cheapest guides. And you guys are the Sherpas. Those of you that are the engineering teams in here, you're the Sherpas. And so do not be the cheapest guides. Be the best guides. 
really guide your client up that mountain. So now you're afraid to start, and um, I really wanted to have more time to be interactive, and when it's a smaller group, we really do that. So I still hope you still had a lot of fun. Um, I'd like you all to take out a piece of paper that you'll throw away and lose or open your laptop, and I'd like you to write down as many things that you think you're going to implement. And I know that you think, oh, I'm going to remember this, I'll download the slide, I'll ask her, but you won't. So um, just take a few notes of some things that you're going to implement when you get back that was meaningful to you, or the things that you're going to research. So I think it's going to be matrices, um, it's going to be storyboards, estimating, um, managing client expectations, doing uh, minimal viable products. Who else has want something that they really liked from today? Yes? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do feel free to go. We're over. If you'd like to stay, um, I can spend some a little time up here, and we can continue talking if you have any specific case uses to you. But did you guys find value from today? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Hi, uh, this is a PSA, if you don't mind. I lost my phone in the session before this. Did anybody pick up a phone by chance? Yay. <laughs> Yay. So this is my friend, Johnny Fox. I just want to give him a plug because we did this session together. And that's me. Yes. Um, so I really like the... Uh Storyboards? Yes. Ever any thought of putting those uh, icons up on like Graphotopia or anything like that? Sharing you know, them? I don't really know how to do that, but if you come talk to me, I'm happy yeah, to do it. I'd, I'd like to use them. Um, but quick question: So, are those like what would the difference be between those and like a flowchart or activity diagram? Like, besides it being a little bit more visual, probably clients like can see would respond to it better just for having that extra visual element. Yes, because it's it's for but two. Th yeah. I would say a little bit more time consuming, right? So if I'm just building, if I just want to build a UML activity diagram, a lot. Not as pretty, but maybe faster to build, right? Yeah, so flow diagrams, I think flow diagrams tell something about logic, where this is more of an end user's workflow through the Drupal site. So it's slightly different because it's not giving them logic points. It's saying, I'm going to get in my car, drive to the store, pick up bread, um, pick up eggs, pick up milk. I'm going to come back, make scrambled eggs, toast. Where the flow diagram might say, get in the car, yes, no. If yes, then this. Um, is the road clear behind me? So it's slightly different, and it doesn't tell the user's experience with the site. And that workflow becomes useful because some of those storyboards I went through are a little complex. And what it d did is that it allowed me as a salesperson to not sell something that the engineer didn't sign off on. And so that's really helpful. Like, how many of you engineers love that? <laughs> well, they said you could do it. Yes? Um, I really liked the uh, flow chart that you were talking about. We actually have used OmniGraffle in the past. Uh -huh. um, and it's fantastic for once you're in the project. Uh -huh. One of the things that we struggle with um, is the discrepancy between what's sold quote unquote, mm -hmm. what is sold to the client, um, and then what is explained from the client to PM or right. engineers. Do you have any um, ideas for how to do that in the business development and the sales process so that things like once we get into, you know, wireframes, like, oh, by the way, my boss reminded me that we have this database that we fully need to right. migrate into. Yeah. Site. So the All storyboards, a that's a really good question. So the storyboards are actually happening when we're doing the, the um, preliminary conversations. It's pre-sales. Okay. Yeah, because... Um, that's how we actually know how to bid out the project because all the workflow is there. We know all the content types. It actually takes a little bit more time and money, but the client really likes the process and we almost always win the project. So um, it gives them a lot of faith that you understand what's going on with their business. So they really like it. And it, it, it gets to be alarmingly fast because you use the same 10 pages, really, and you're just moving the little icons around and changing the narrative down the right side. So um, I have my account manager 
actually sit in on the sales meetings when we get to that point, and then she just does them. <laughs> so they're not even coming from very, um, it, it's not coming from engineering, it's coming from the sales side of things. And so how, how many here do sales? Like it's a really powerful sales tool. Like if, you, if you're interviewing for shops, who are you gonna hire? The person that like, maybe sometimes they'll hire someone that did a pretty mock-up, but someone that walked them through their own idea is they feel very connected to. Anything else? Yes. Um, so when you have a client that one thing that resonated with me where, where, where they want to talk through every change, they yeah. want to be involved, it's easier to set those expectations beforehand. Yes. But you don't always know, right, what, what, how they're going to be. So, yeah. so do you try to account for that in your meetings beforehand, or do you just have to sit down with them and they might say, well, you didn't tell me we weren't going to You do kind everything. of know, because if, if someone hires you on the first meeting after a short time, that's a bad thing, right? Like, they don't even know what they're buying. If, they, if you have to come back for five meetings, that's too much, too. Remember that one slide that says too much, too little? It's like neither of things are, those things are good. And you can tell because they start to have really detailed um, emails to you. And they, they start, like, needing a lot of narrative. So you kind of get a feel for it. But it should just be part of your normal thing that says, this is our typical meeting schedule. Like, we have a sprint. We have a kickoff. We have a client meeting. It lasts us long. We expect to communicate with you daily through Basecamp, and then just kind of set that that's the expectation. And then at the end of the next sprint, if they've been over communicative, you can talk about that. Say, hey, I see that your project is being very account management heavy. Um, do you need me to assign more resources to that? And we can just add that to your project. <laughs> yeah. So yes, let them know they're being resource heavy, right? Like that's a really nice way of saying, quit taking so much of my time. Um, and I think, uh, too, especially for uh, uh, those of you in universities, the more formulaic you can make your meetings and your process for developing a site, the, s the safer you'll be. Anything else? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Your <laughs> oh, you guys are so great. Thanks for hanging out. I wonder if you could talk about the RFP process a little bit, because to me, RFP is recipe for problems. Uh, yeah. I've gotten some pretty <laughs> toxic clients that way, but that, that yeah. does seem to be the way that a lot of interesting work comes out. So. It does. How many of you have been successful with RFPs? Huh. That's, that's a really high number. So, <laughs> darn it. You guys should support my theories. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, I don't like RFPs, and I'll tell you why. They're either... Um, predisposed to already somebody already working in it and, and institutions have to put out RFPs but they already know who they're going to hire especially if it's very droopily like if it's like we need 12 content types and 14 views and blah 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 it's like you already know Drupal something's going on or if they're so vague they don't know any Drupal and so it's not going to work either um, I haven't found RFPs good because they tend to be fixed bid and unfortunately they don't pay for discovery and then you get in there and find out there were 24 things that they didn't mention in the RFP that you are now responsible for. Yeah. And so it's really tough. And it's one of those opportunity costs. Um, some people are brilliant at them, and they can kind of structure RFPs to work for them. I get annoyed by having to do them. So I would rather go find work with people who want to work with me in my city where I can see them and meet with them than chase RFPs far away. Right. Um, my, my, success rate in closing a project where they're in my city is very high. My success rate with RFPs is very low. So Good. if that Thanks. helps. Yeah. Hi, this is, I'm glad this is my last session because this is my favorite. Um, oh, thank, thank you. you. Um, yeah, oh. super cool. Um, so I really wanted to ask you when you talk about uh, the pixel perfect client that gets hung up on design and I, yeah. Uh, the way that my shop works and our team works, we're, I think we do a very good job of, you know, our design happens very late in the process. Nice. Um, it, but how, I really want to know from a realistic standpoint, like how late do you actually start? And how do you, I, I feel like in a lot of projects, I spend the first three weeks telling the client why it's okay that they're not going to see a design. Yes. In, until six months from now, or yeah. seven or eight months from now. Yeah. But what's some of the tips or techniques you use to reassure them that it's okay 
we're not going to see anything pretty for a very long time. Yeah, it's a very different thing. And especially, like I will say, at least now people don't ask for a design as part, the, part of, of the, the proposal, estimating yeah. proposal. But I think you're, the strongest asset, because I think you're, you're probably very creative, is showing them the portfolio and say, mm -hmm. this is the way we work. Mm -hmm. It's very successful, and it saves you a lot of time and money. Usually people will cave when they say, we can do this now, but you're going to have to pay me to redo yeah. it several times. And I have found this way to be... So there's a feel, felt, found. I understand mm -hmm. how you feel. Others, my other clients, have felt the same way. But what we found is that this is the most successful way to have a project. Very cool. Because they're, everyone feels afraid and alone. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't quite get into all of this, but... The reason clients are so difficult is because they're afraid. They're terrified. They're terrified. Yeah. It's like me planning a summit to Everest for all of you. I would be terrified because <laughs> I'm going to kill you. And so it's not a good day. And they feel the same way. They're responsible for something they've probably never done before. They mm -hmm. have no expertise in. They have to trust you and their job's on the line. Their reputation's on the line. Mm -hmm. So yes, the feel felt found is a really good way to mm -hmm. do that. Oh, I also think the second I don't think people talk about money soon enough. Yes. So as soon as you can be equalizing and say, if we do this, this is the dollar amount. Like, this will cost you actually these dollars. Then all of a sudden, they're very comfortable about yeah. talking about exactly. why they won't actually do that then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Well, thank you very You're much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks. Anybody else? Uh, sorry, just quickly. So yeah. um, you did mention Sprint and Agile and yes. Scrum and all that. But then earlier on, you're talking about leave design to the end. Mm -hmm. So, no, I'm not an agile purist, but no, me neither. Um, so, how, but how? So, if if I was an agile purist, I would say, well, you're not producing uh, releasable features, then, mm -hmm. right? Because they're not themed. Right. Um, and then the reason I ask that is because you know, like we always bend the rules or whatever. In our projects, where okay, we're building the functionality, and then do we create separate user stories for the theming part of it, and where do they come in the sprints? But then I always struggle because there's that part of me that's reading all this theory around Agile and saying, um, we're not producing production-ready software then. Oh, okay. Right? Um, so how do I, you... Here, let me get to that slide that has all the stuff on it. Do you, you understand what I'm saying in terms of the struggle? A that, little bit, yeah. yes. So I, I need to get... I guess my point is that if we leave design to the end, is so that, are we still being agile in that, in that case? Yes. Or are we kind of being like scrum okay. fall, right? So let's look at this. So what happens is that see where development and design are four and five. They're really four A and four B. They're happening in tandem. So while the engineering team goes off and builds, the design team now starts designing and working with the client on design. And what it's actually really helpful is a little bit of a magician's trick. Like you worked through all the discovery and now your engineering team is in sprints. And then you show them shiny thing, shiny thing, come over here, let's look at pixels and colors now. And they quit bothering you around engineering so you can build something. And so it's a really good way so that you have design and development now happening in tandem. And then theming happens when design and development are done. So once they've approved all the designs, engineering is done. Sometimes one happens slightly before the other, but they really take about usually the same amount of time. Um, and then they accept all of the functionality and sign off on that. The designs and comps are ready to go. And then you theme in one, two sprints. Like there's nothing else really going on, QA documentation, bug fixes, but you're theming during that time and then the site's ready to go. It's really effective. So it's a little bit separating out theming from design. Then. Yes, yes, they're completely separate. Theming happens when everything else is done and not until then. That's the magic. Like that's where you really have this, the margins. Uh, anything else? You guys have been so awesome. Thank you for hanging out. It was really fun. Come talk to me. And don't forget about your free, um, free account at getpantheon.com. And you can talk to him about top shelf modules if you want to know more about that. Hi. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. What are you going to implement? What are you going to implement?